Okay, I think we uh, we should uh, get started. So this is uh, the second uh, IS Distinguished Lecture delivered by Professor uh, Tang Daniel. Since I already gave an uh, introduction about Tang, so I'm not going to do it again. I can do it again, I guess. But uh, anyway, so today is really uh, a day we learn from nature. So we have actually two lectures today. One will be given by Professor Tang Daniel uh, now. And uh, there will be two more lectures to be delivered by Professor uh, Sanjay Sen from uh, National Center of uh, Biological Science, NCBS, India. And he will be giving the, his first talk in the afternoon at uh, 2 o'clock. Uh, not, not in this venue, at uh, 4504. And he will talk about how insects, uh, uh, how insects find the odor, I guess. Right, and then he will share the two uh, interesting stories on Monday, Monday morning, 30, again at room 4504. So for those of you who are very interested in uh, insects, uh, nature bio, uh, bio engineering, you're more than welcome to join those two lectures. So I just give, want to give a little bit of background why uh, we're doing a lot of uh, this uh, uh, seminars, interface engineering and biology. As many of you know, the the one of uh, HKUST has very strong tradition in the research of robotics, and uh, we have very strong uh, uh, group led by uh, Professor Michael Wang and colleagues in Robotics Institute, and also uh, the university has uh, has uh, gained a lot of reputations in running in organizing this uh, undergraduate student-led uh, robotics autonomous system competitions. So uh, clearly, uh, the next generation of uh, autonomous system can be the inter can be the ideas could the inspiration can come from nature. So we think that it's actually a good opportunity for us to learn uh, what are the ideas that we can learn from nature, what are the ideas we can borrow from nature to in to, to bring it back for those autonomous system robotics uh, applications. So this is one of the things doing, and the Division of Biomedical Engineering will continue to develop and uh, promote those areas. And we welcome students, colleagues, and community to join us on these very important endeavors. So without further ado, please join me to welcome Professor Tom Daniel for this morning. Uh, I see some familiar faces uh, from bioengineering last spring or something like that. And you'll see some familiar slides, but some new material as well. So I'll apologize in advance. Um, so I, I always like to begin with acknowledgments because this way you get to the most important part right away is who, who's really behind all of uh, what I have to talk about. So of course, uh, Yiming has been um, a gracious host, um, overfeeding me um, and uh, also keeping me very busy. Uh, the IAS and BME have been very supportive of these visits, uh, as well as uh, my funding agencies uh, that I'll um, talk about later. Uh, but uh, particularly, uh, the Guggenheim allowed me uh, some time to fly around and be on sabbatical. Um, the Naval Research, National Science Foundation, and the Air Force Office of Scientific Research are uh, funding a lot of the research I'm going to talk about today. Um, and the most important thing is who really does the research and who really does the creativity. Uh, I listed here a most, but certainly not all, of the people involved in, in the projects, and they span some fantastic and uh, current and some now former postdocs uh, that I have up here, uh, and uh, some fantastic current and now some former graduate students, undergraduates, and high school students have all been involved in, in the research in various ways. Um, and um, I, I showed this to the group last year, and I wanted to bring it back again. Um, this is a publication uh, that came out from the National Research Council in the US. And it has an interesting statement. Um, it says, biological research is in the midst of a revolutionary change due to the integration of powerful technologies along with new concepts and methods derived from the inclusion of physical sciences, mathematics, computational sciences, and engineering. To be a biologist today is becoming more and more an integrated discipline, that discipline that lies between the physical sciences and the natural sciences. And it's just increasingly hard to make great progress without being somewhat quantitative. 
Okay? So that's a message we have for biologists. And, and, and at the same time, advances in biological sciences hold immense promise for many, many challenges that we face, from food and health and safety to deep understanding of natural systems. Um, there was also, I don't know how that happened, um, another study that came out from MIT, um, which is a study called The Convergence of the Life Sciences, Physical Sciences, and Engineering. And essentially what both of these are saying is our traditional bins that I'm in biology department, I'm in the engineering department, those traditional bins are not particularly healthy. They're necessary for administrative reasons, but they're not healthy. And this says that the convergence of these domains is a sort of a new paradigm for how sciences are being done. Whether you call it the life sciences or engineering or whatever, there's common themes among all of these. And it's just a broad array from healthcare to energy, food, climate, water, disaster relief, everything. These are really, really hard problems. But there are some solutions that are useful in nature, and there are some solutions that are useful in engineering. Um, so we have this confluence of engineering and the life sciences. And that confluence is something I want to explore today uh, with a particularly heavy biological bend. Okay? But um, I do want to point out that I'm going to begin with examples. And I, I did this for a bunch of the students that are here, but I, we did it as an exercise. I'm just going to reproduce some of the results of, of solutions to engineering problems. And what I call them billions of existence proofs. That is, something exists already, and it's doing an amazing thing. Let's see what some of these billions of existence proofs are. Okay? And then um, I'm going to focus on just two um, uh, studies in the lab. One um, that I had talked a little about last year, and then one that's brand new, and in fact, in, just now in press uh, as of two days ago. So um, I'm a little more excited about this, the last topic of anything. Um, the former one is looking to biology and trying to use sort of engineering principles to understand how information is being processed, but at the same time use our understanding of biology to suggest some novel technologies. Okay? This one is a very different approach. It's saying, can I use formal engineering methods to find out how natural systems work? That, that's just a fundamentally different challenge. Okay? So let me jump in to you know, how we commonly think, commonly think of sort of the role of engineering in the life sciences. And I put it in that forward direction. That is, we typically think of bringing to bear modern technologies, computing, devices, algorithms, mathematics to solve life science problems. And, and the ones that, of course, get the most attention are the ones that assist us and aid us in particularly healthcare and the like. But it's very much technology in the service of a human need. Okay? Um, I want to point out the flip direction. That is, looking to life sciences in the service of inspiring new technologies is a little less common. right? But in fact, no less important. So um, examples, and we talked about this before, are looking to how natural systems use and deploy mechanical processes in um, accomplishing a task like locomotion. So this cheetah uh, is running on extremely elastic limbs with a particular curvature. It isn't that you're going to reproduce exactly that limb in providing an assistive or replacement device, but you're going to replace or use the principle of elastic energy storage and very careful collision dynamics with the ground given by the morphology or the structure, to give an effective solution that's passive. Okay? And this is, this, um, that limb is called the cheetah leg. right? And it's named aptly after the cheetah leg. But this, this idea of elasticity and uh, sort of structural dynamics um, of the natural system deployed in principle in living systems has also been uh, deployed conceptually and in principle in robotic systems. So there's a, a very classic set of studies initially done in cockroach uh, running with um, doing analytic studies of how the elasticity of the legs influences stability and dynamics of the system and how much of the control can be offloaded 
to the passive dynamics. And that idea was uh, deployed in hardware in, in, in robotic systems like this uh, device here, uh, largely in um, uh, groups at Berkeley with Bob Full and, and Dan Kotichek and others. Okay? Um, in both directions, and this is what I pointed out in my earlier talk here, is you're, you're discovering principle nature uses in accomplishing challenging tasks to inspire new technologies. And at the same time, you want to discover and develop new technologies to understand how natural systems work. In, in other words, it's very, very hard for us to understand processing and central processing of nervous systems absent technology. You just can't do it. And we're looking to get more and more uh, feedback between these two domains. Okay? So that's the background for my talk. Um, obviously, when we're looking and thinking about natural solutions to engineering problems, we have to think about the fundamental theories of biology. And as it turns out, there is only one theory that is unique to biology. Uh, what is it? Ev yeah, absolutely, evolution. And let me drill down on this. It is a very, very patient engineering process. It takes solutions that are not as successful as other solutions and essentially eliminates those. Okay? It's got lots and lots of time and lots and lots of versions. <laughs> okay? It relies on three fundamental ideas. That is, there are variation in traits. That is, I'm not identical to uh, Professor Sunny. And I'm, I'm grateful for it. Um, and, uh, uh, and I also have traits that are heritable. So those traits pass on from successive generations. And uh, we have differential survival. Um, although I think we'll both make it out of this talk today. Okay? Um, evolution is subject to constraints. This came up uh, in the last talk. That is, I'm not free to all of a sudden take my... Uh, bones and say, you know, I think I'd like titanium today. I have evolutionary constraints, I have developmental constraints, and I have historic constraints, phylogenetic constraints. I'm not, I'm not free to just create anything new. So evolution is this infinitely patient engineering process operating under constraints and history. Okay? So that's actually a really interesting idea that you're solving really, really, really hard engineering problems given really, really important constraints. Right? It is a necessarily a process that leads to change and adaptation, necessarily. It is also not an optimization process. This is often misunderstood. Evolution is not optimizing. It's simply I can run faster than my friend who's being chased by a cheetah. Okay? As long as the cheetah gets my friend, I'm okay. Right? It is not directed. Evolution does not say I will make it better this way. Right? But that said, it gives rise to these billions of existence proofs of solutions to really hard problems. Locomotion on land, locomotion in complex habitats, obstacle avoidance, flight, swimming. Uh, the list goes on. Every habitat of life, every habitat on the planet has uh, an occupant of some living organism somewhere. Right? This idea of evolution... Um, was certainly understood at the turn of the century. And I, I love this quote here. And I, I, uh, this is from, from the New York Times, October 9th, uh, 1903. And, and I, I'm looking over at a group here that builds flying robotics. Uh, so 1903, they say, the flying machine, which will really fly, might be evolved by the combined and continuous efforts of mathematicians and mechanicians in from 1 million to 10 million years. I mean, they were being optimistic, actually. Um, they had a sense of the length of the fossil record. Um, that same day, in the diary of Orville and Wilbur Wright, it's the following line. We started assembly. And that was for the first flying craft. So they beat evolution by a few millennia. Okay? And what they did is they tinkered and basically tried lots and lots of things. Right? But you'll also notice that they use some structures that clearly were done from observation. Clearly, it did not come out of thin air. I apologize for the pun. It came from observation. Right? And my favorite uh, philosopher, uh, 
Yogi Berra, uh, the best catcher in baseball history with the New York Yankees, said, you can see a lot just by looking. Um, great phrase. And in fact, that idea um, has a rich, rich history in what we look to nature for our understanding of technologies. Um, Leonardo da Vinci uh, produced something called the Codex. And uh, actually, Bill Gates recently bought the Codex, and that lives now in Seattle. And there's an Italian scholar of da Vinci, of Leonardo, who's studying the Codex. And there's a section of the Codex about life, and particularly about, as it turns out, flight. And a recent translation, it gives me chills to repeat this, but I'm going to do it. This is in the year about 1500, okay? And he had been looking at flight and looking at uh, uh, a whole variety of creatures. And I, 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 uh, but these are drawings of, of Leonardo of his imagining of airflow and sort of some ideas of force vectors. This is pre-Newtonian. This is pre-Bernoulli. This is Leonardo. And here's a translation from um, the section of the codex called Suvolo degli Uccelli. I mean, on the, I'd love to speak Italian. Uh, uh, on the flight of birds. And he says, what quality of air, this is observation of nature, right? What quality of air surround birds in flight? The air surrounding the bird is above thinner, above thinner than the usual thinness of the other air. I know this is complicated. As below, it is thicker than the same in proportion to the velocity of the bird and its motion forward. That's Bernoulli's principle. When did Bernoulli live? Right? 200 years later. I, I, and where did Bernoulli get his ideas? This codec was not translated. You know. I, and by the way, if anybody has any clue to how Leonardo came to that statement by watching nature, you, please let me know. I, I find this nothing short of eerie. Maybe evidence of a time machine. I don't know. I'm just teasing. Okay. But it's an existence proof that flight is possible, and there's an early engineering analysis of it. This is, this is stunning. Okay. This existence proof and our looking to nature in flight, and I'll just do this one more uh, uh, slide, uh, uh, has, has a really nice recent history, right? That despite our watching nature for millennia, sometimes we ignore things that are totally obvious. Um, this is a, a, a picture of a, of a jet. I think it's a Gulf Stream coming right at us. And you see in the wake this uh, vortical structure, which is the vorticity shed from the wings in the way. And that leads to a tip vortex. And that tip vortex represents a loss of what we call circulation on the wing, a feature that's critical for the upward forces generated by the wing. Right? The lift, therefore, depends on the circulation, and circulation is lost from the tips in this tip vortex, right? Um, in many flying birds, and there are other examples around there, the tips of the wing are highly modified in what are called spread wing tips, right? And those spread wing tips, um, as it turns out, are mechanisms that promote the retention of vorticity on the wing by a sort of a complicated, not very well understood process, but the vorticity is shed into ever smaller ones, retaining, in a sense, uh, more vorticity uh, uh, wing-bound structures. And it was only within the last 20 years or so, and I have to turn to the aeronautic engineers here, somewhere around there, that we started modifying wingtips uh, according to you know, observations from nature. These are now wingtip modifiers. Okay. Um, but the process had been around. People had been talking about it. It just took a while to translate from our observations to, in fact, uh, application. The list now goes on. I'm just going to quickly go through a few. Velcro is something that was discovered from burrs, and some poor person kept pulling them off their dog and uh, uh, eventually gave rise to uh, a really wonderful uh, and ubiquitous, uh, somewhat irritating fastener. Uh, water repellent paints, we've, they've been around, but in fact recently uh, it was revealed that the microstructure of the lotus um, has this, this extreme microstructure interacts with the surface tension of droplets to make these paints water repellent. It's now called lotusan. Uh, adhesion uh, without, uh, without glue. Um, this is something Bob Full had 
uh, been one of the early pioneers on, on what I would call bio-inspired systems or nature-inspired systems. He is, in fact, the editor of the journal uh, Bio-Inspiration and Biomimetics, I think. He's one of the founding editors. But he spent some considerable time demonstrating that the ultra-tiny microstructure on the feet of geckos, they're so tiny that they permit van der Waals forces to form an effective adhesion. There's no glue. Okay? And they've tested it in robotic systems and have, have gone on from there. This is him giving a TED Talk. If you want to have a really inspiring speaker come here, bring Bob Full. Um, in many ways, he's a big man in the field. Water capture discovered uh, passive mechanisms from um, uh, beetles in the Namib Desert. Uh, the beetle has a particular microstructure on its carapace so that when the wind blows over it, that um, the microstructure favors some local aerodynamic effects that leads to condensation of fluid here, and that fluid drains down. And a group of investigators uh, took this concept and built passive water capture devices for arid environments. This is just wonderful. And it, this goes on and on. Aerodynamic efficiencies uh, in uh, car design, believe it or not, that actually is a good design. I've never been impressed by it, but apparently uh, fluid dynamics are impressed by it. Uh, uh, one of my favorite stories is um, going too far. Uh, this is a great controversy. Sharks have these amazing microstructures, which are argued, argued to be drag reducing. So, uh, and there was some evidence uh, that if you took shark skin, you get lower shear stresses on it. Um, uh, they made a swimsuit, that's Stephen Phelps uh, of swimming fame, Olympic medalist, wearing a swimsuit that has that microstructure. And then there's a wonderful article that says, actually, it doesn't work. Um, but uh, it was a great idea. So you have this really scratchy suit that doesn't do you any good. It does well for the shark. It does poorly for humans. And there's a message there. Don't just copy it and think it's going to work. Okay? It works well for a shark because of the geometry of the shark and how a shark swims. Right? It works poorly for humans because of how they swim in their geometry. Uh, there's some evidence that it actually slows you down, uh, which I liked. Sensing and computing, I talked about that last time, uh, from optic flow sensing and the circuits supporting optic flow sensing to circuits supporting uh, edge and object recognition derived from looking at neural circuits in the retina. Uh, those are really, really interesting uh, problems. And of course, uh, the thing I'm going to talk about are uh, inertial measurement units. So you know, I, I wanted to just very quickly you know, s survey some fun natural solutions to engineering problems, extracting water, swimming, flying, whatever. Okay? And then what I'm going to do is focus on, on two projects. One <coughs> Sanjay actually worked on uh, with me a while ago. I'm not going to talk about that. Sorry. Um, it wasn't very good work. No, <laughs> just, just teasing. Um, it was excellent work. It appeared in science, uh, but I'm not going to talk about it. And then something that we're just um, publishing now. Okay. So inertial sensing. Um, uh, there isn't a flying vehicle that doesn't have some sort of IMU. Good luck flying it if it didn't. And, and, and as you'll see in a minute, um, uh, nature uses that as well. So IMUs are present, obviously, in uh, commercial aircraft along with global positioning, and they have multiple IMUs. I actually don't know how many are on a typical 747. It's not that many. It's like maybe four. Do you know? Uh, handful. handful, right? Handful of inertial measurement units. Uh, usually at least one six degree of freedom in uh, a, a quadcopter, and this is, of course, the uh, DGI uh, Version 4, I forgot the name of it. Phantom. Phantom 4, right. Uh, with camera, so it's got vision, it's got IMU, it has some sensing going on, it's capable of a lot of cool flight dynamics. I have an IMU in my cell phone, as I think most of you do. Uh, so they're everywhere, right? And they're everywhere because they're needed for effective dynamic control. And it turns out that flying animals desperately need them. And the reason they desperately need them is if you try and fly with just your visual system, it's too slow. Uh, and I'll go over that later. 
But visual flight control is too slow for um, these inherently unstable devices to work. So they need multiple sensory streams for effective control of their dynamics. And in fact, that's a common theme over and over again in biology. We need multiple streams of information for most effective control. And the richer and more complex these streams are, the better off we do. Okay? <clears throat> Probably the, the most uh, well-known biological gyroscope or inertial me measurement unit is found in flies, and flies have the name diptera, D-I-P-T-E-R-A, which means die, terra, two wings. So all the flies, all of that uh, taxon, they only have two wings. All other insects have four wings, okay? And the back wings of these insects are highly modified structures, so these structures here are called haltiers. And as you'll see in a minute, we have a collaboration with uh, colleagues at Oxford on these. These haltiers, just like back wings, beat up and down. Okay? And as it turns out, these haltiers are richly, richly sensed with mechanosensitive structures. Okay? Uh, I'm going to do a demonstration. Um, hmm, I'm just going to use my arm because I think there's nothing. Okay, I'm going to do a demonstration of how this haltier works. So the halt here, just like the wing, is beating up and down like this, okay? And um, the wings beat up and down, the halt here is beat up and down. And in fact, on one side, they beat approximately antiphase in most insects, okay? And there's details of the control of this. So if you take a mass and you move it up and down like this and you rotate in the orthogonal direction, you'll establish a Coriolis force, okay? And that's... Uh, Therefore, that mass beating up and down will experience a torque driving it into a, a, an oscillation, the off axis. Um, let me, <laughs> I'm going to rotate this so it makes more sense. So here it is beating up and down, okay? And uh, the scale is you know, roughly you know, pi up and pi down. So it's a huge angular change. But in the presence of an orthogonal rotation, that weak Coriolis torque drives a lateral displacement, and that lateral displacement operates at about twice the frequency. Okay? And that lateral displacement, um, and there's some controversy now emerging on how that's detected, but it is detected by a set of sensors at the base of the halt here. And this is a high-resolution um, uh, micro-CT of a halt here from a fly. There's the knob at the end. So it's got a mass that it vibrates. There's a long shaft, and this array here is a set of strain sensors, and actually it's a row of them. The visual image looks like a line, but in fact there's a discrete set of them. And you know, cumulatively there's a chunk here, there's a chunk here, and if you look at that, there's chunks on the other side as well. Okay? And that structure has an amazingly complex base. And this is vibrated up and down. There you can begin to see the separate units uh, of sensing. That's a lot of strain sensors at the base. By the way, we have no idea how the nervous system is actually processing all of them. It's an array. okay? And there's something about array detection that we suspect is a very, very interesting problem here. Um, what you can do, and what a graduate, past graduate student of mine, Jessica Fox, now faculty at Case Western, did, is you can record with very fine electrodes in the axons extending down from these sensors, and you can measure their um, encoding properties. And I talked a little about that last time. I won't repeat it here, okay? But suffice it to say that they encode information at an extremely high rate. So not only are they a dense array, each individual is encoding at a very high bit rate, at about 200 bits per second per neuron. Okay? That's actually, and given the number of neurons, that's actually a pretty good, that's a pretty good uh, sensor that you've just produced. Okay? Uh, the fly visual neuron are much, much slower. Right? And just for a frame of reference, the medial temporal lobe neurons in, in visual cortex of the monkey, for example, and this would be probably like our neurons, about the same, you know, slightly lower still, about 12. So these are very, very, very fast, very, very robust sensors, and, and we're still trying to figure out how they work. Um, I want to come back to that word evolution. Um, 
All tears are derived from wings. Right? And, and I'm going to be a little inaccurate, so the biologists in the audience, you know, I apologize in advance, but the inaccuracy is it's not like evolution goes, gee, I need a gyroscope. Let me take that wing and turn it into something and then use it as a gyroscope. It's not a post, it's not directed. In order for this structure to evolve a gyroscopic sensing, sensing function, evolution suggests that its antecedent had to serve at least a little bit of that function, or natural selection could not favor the development and origin of this novel gyroscope. Evolution suggests that flapping wings would have had to, at some point, serve this gyroscopic function. Um, well, let's, let's think about this no problem. This animal here is the hawk moth, Manduca sexta. Uh, it's been a, sort of a model organism in my lab. It's like everybody else's Drosophila. And there are maybe about 30 or 40 labs, something like that, probably more than that, uh, studying these as model systems. They actually were initially developed as model systems for neuronal growth and neuronal uh, pattern formation. Uh, very pioneering work done on that. Flies around, and its wings, by the way, are richly, richly equipped with strain sensors, and they're distributed over the surface of the wing. The distribution is fairly well known now. Okay. Uh, these are four wings. The front and the hind wings are coupled. And as the animal flies around, I can assure you that the wings have mass. I can assure you that they're flapping. And if you take a mass and it's uh, rotating in one axis and you rotate in the orthogonal axis, I guarantee you'll have a Coriolis force. I mean, by definition, you do. <laughs> it's a distributed mass. And <clears throat> it has linear accelerations, Euler forces, centrifugal, and Coriolis. All of those are going on. And the distribution of sensors on the wing is quite broad. There's about 200, uh, about 500 occur in two patches of about 200 each at the base of the wing. So just like the Haltier, it has strain sensor arrays at its base. Um, the problem, <laughs> the problem we have is that um, the Haltier we talk about it as moving in one axis and being subject to a lateral deflection in the orthogonal axis. If I take a plate like this and I flap it in this axis, I'm not going to get a bend in this axis because of the extremely high second moment of area. Well, this is odd. What, what would a Coriolis force do to a flapping wing? What would happen if I flap this wing up and down, and I have a distribution of mass. I'm not going to get that lateral deflection. I get a different mode of excitation. And what Annika Eberly and Brad Dickerson did in this series of beautiful studies, and these are amazing graduate students, um, demonstrated, A, that the mode you get using just using Euler-Lagrange approach, this sort of simple dynamical systems approach, trying to, oh, did that not play? Um, there it is. <laughs> you excite a torsional mode in the wing. Okay? Now, this torsional mode is, a, I'm showing you an exaggeration. Okay? The wing is flapping, right? And it's under, uh, rotating. And in response, it got, undergoes a torsional mode. I was showing you that mode in the frame of reference moving with the wing. So it's, it's not just sitting there doing that. But so it's doing this motion. Right? And it's excited by the Coriolis force. Okay? Uh, here's, a, I think, another movie that sort of demonstrates that they start this. And again, this is a wing rotating. And we're just staying in the frame of the flap just to demonstrate that. Um, two other things, and I, I won't review it here, is Brad actually had to demonstrate, well, are, is the animal, is it actually attentive to the torsion of the wing? I mean, can the animal actually use that strain field to detect the effective pitching that the wing does. And I'll just tell you what he did. <laughs> it is, uh, came out about a year and a half ago, two years ago. Is he placed super tiny magnets on the wing and, while the, and did nothing else. Just while the animal's flapping, there's super tiny magnets. And the animal flaps around, and it has no particular response. It just, we give it a visual world, and it will respond with re visual reflexes. And then he immersed the entire system in a rotating magnetic field 
So you could rotate the field and give the animal a mechanical rotational stimulus as well as a visual one. And when the magnetic field was turned on, the animal's reflexes were amplified, clearly demonstrating they're attentive to that torsion. Um, so in a series of studies uh, with Annika and, uh, and others in the lab, we've gone on to, to talk about strain sensing, torsional strain sensing and flapping wing structures as a mode of detecting body rotations. Basically, the actuator, the thing that moves the insect, could also be a sensor, the thing that reports the body dynamics. That's actually a novel concept, that your actuator and sensor could be one and the same. The control theorists around, among you might well go, what would it mean if both my actuation and sensor are exactly that same device? Uh, so we've now done robotic instantiation of this, and we're building devices that, in fact, flap and rotate and asking, can we use these as our effective gyroscopes and propulsors? Sort of a unique new way of thinking about it. Uh, as I talked about last time, there are neural mechanisms for encoding the information, and can we use layer onto this neural processing of that to make really, really effective flight control systems? This is a case where we looked to nature, did some hardcore engineering, or not as hardcore as you guys do, but for us. You know, we put in the college effort and um, came out with an idea from nature for a new gyroscopic sensor, new inertial, inertial measurement. Probably not useful for an airplane. There are relatively few I fly whose wings flap. Uh, preferably they don't flap at all. But it's still an interesting idea for a particularly flapping flight vehicle. So it's been now uh, with Sean Humbert, one of our collaborators, and now Sarah Bergbreiter, are fabricating flight vehicles with distributed strain sensing. Uh, they're using the distribution of strain sensing as a general idea for gust rejection and flight control. Strain sensing has this really nice report that you get before you have a lot of acceleration. So it's really, really nice. Um, Sean is particularly interested in gust rejection, so how would you get... Uh, micro air vehicles or small drones to inspect <laughs> in really dangerous places to inspect, uh, you know, say a windmill or something like that. That's a fun problem where you really need this kind of melding of gust rejection and the like, okay? All right, last part of my talk. Um, what, I was, what, what I attempted to do is give you a little history and then a little example of where we are currently looking at inertial sensing. And this is in the service of developing potentially new technologies. Admittedly, I'm very motivated just to understand how living systems operate. But I, I guarantee the more I learn, the more useful information I, I, I will get for potential technology. But let me, let me also own up to the fact that there's this, what I call biology with no apology. Um, that is, engineering can help me understand neural systems. And, and I'm fine with that. So what I'm going to do is dive into something that we just had accepted, and um, it's actually using engineering methods to try and tease out how uh, neural systems resolve multiple streams of sensory information. This is a hard problem. As it turns out, we, neuroscience community, have been doing sort of an experimental approach that I think is, at the end of the day, unwise. Okay. So here is that hawk moth. This is a video uh, by my colleague and, and collaborator, Mark Willis, one of the best biologists I, I know. Uh, fantastic neuroscientist, fantastic behaviorist. And this is a normal, well, this is what they do. This is what hawk moths really do. They come and they feed from flowers and they lay eggs and they mate and they die. It's, it's pretty simple life. Um, and uh, as they're feeding from the flowers, the flowers are moving. The animal has a very long, thin, Proboscis, and so it has to actually deploy that, insert it into the flower while it's flying, right? Sort of track the flower and get the nectar out of it. That's that's I, that's a hard problem. Okay, I'm impressed that they can do it, and they do it all night long, right? Uh, here again is my moth flying, and let me just remind you of the sensory modalities that it has. It has uh, chemosensory pathways, so it detects the flowers chemically, right? It has, uh, you know, and some of these are in the antennae, some of them are in the feet, the tarsi, and more. Obviously, it has eyes, and it has several uh, really, really interesting low-light processing circuits, so they're operating in very low-light uh, environments, and that's going to be a problem. 
Because under low light, I need to keep my shutter open. That means my visual delays are long. Okay? And they have, obviously, this mechanosensory stuff we've been talking about. Aerodynamic, gravitational, proprioceptive, and, and, and the like. This rich set of sensory modalities, multiple inputs, appear as multiple outputs. So this is a MIMO system. Multiple input, multiple output. With wings, the abdomen, head, legs, antennae, everything is being controlled based on the sensory data flow. Vision is generally slow. And our group has spent some time documenting this. The vision, visual systems have delays on the order of 100 to 200 milliseconds. The darker the environment is, the longer the delay. Just like when I take a picture with the camera, the darker the light levels, the longer I have to hold the shutter open. As you'll see, we wanted to explore, could we use robotics to probe how the neural shutter is working? Right? It's an interesting problem. So what we're interested in doing is asking what the relative contributions are of multiple streams. How do we assess that? And how do we measure their dynamics and performance? So we're going to use traditional engineering approaches. But I'm going to preface this by saying what a biologist might have done is say, oh, if I want to know how important vision is, I'll take the eyes off or block vision and look at everything else. If I want to know, I mean, you, you know, cover over the eyes or do something like that. If I want to know how important mechanosensing is, let's say I'm feeding from a flower, I'll cut the proboscis off and uh, see how it does. Now, the, the reality is no insect can fly without vision. So that's already a problem. I can't do what we call sensory isolation, which is a very traditional neural approach, right? And by the way, they're not going to flower track if they can't, if they don't have a proboscis, right? So we have some, frankly, practical limits to doing sensory isolation, but I'm going to argue that there's intellectual limits why we shouldn't. Okay. So here is our, um, I wrote, uh, this, is sort of, this is not bio-inspired robotics, okay? This is robot-inspired biology, okay. Uh, so we, we, we have these robotic flowers that we built, and I'm going to work you through some of these examples. This is a particular one. It's moving in a very erratic manner on purpose. That erratic manner happens to be a superposition of about 17 sinusoids, okay? De literally superimposed on purpose. So it's not white noise motion. It's a discrete, linearly superimposed sine waves, Okay. And so it gives this really erratic, unpredictable measurement. Um, I, I put the, the crew up here. Um, Itai Roth is probably the pioneer in using sort of this, um, what will eventually be system identification methods for freely flying or freely behaving animals. Simon Sponberg, he's a postdoc currently in the lab. Simon is uh, faculty in physics now at Georgia Tech. Uh, uh, Robert is in the Peace Corps now, and John Dyer is on the faculty at Northwest University. So, but they, these are all involved in various parts of this project. And it, <clears throat> the first part of the project said, well, <clears throat> if I have this moth flying around, and it's tracking this device, and I'm interested in knowing if I change the luminance levels and the neural filtering changes, could I use the behavior to actually predict changes in the neural, measure the predicted changes in the neural filter? So think about this. Everything is going to be the same. The animal is going to be feeding from this robotically actuated flower, right? The plant is the same, meaning I meant by the, the, the engineering term, the plant, not the plant. Uh, the, the physical structure is the same. It's still the same moth. It weighs about the same. It's got the same wings. So everything is identical. I'm just going to drop the luminance levels and look for adaptation in the neural filter. Okay? So it's using robotics to probe something in the emergent dynamics and over a broad frequency range. So we're going to track the flower robot motion and the animal's motion. And I'll just this is, just came out in science a year ago. Um, this um, tracking behavior, uh, I'm, I'm sort of putting a lot uh, under the carpet, ha is done under two luminance levels, uh, under, under bright light, right, and under dim light in, in blue. And it turns out the tracking error gets worse under dim light, which is exactly what we predicted. And it gets worse at the frequency domain in which we predicted that to get longer based on uh, work done by Eric uh, Warrant and David O'Carroll. Okay? But what we found rather interesting is it, it gets worse out here. It's effectively under low frequencies, 
under the discrete frequencies of the flower motion where uh, 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 these are below a hertz, you know, there's really no difference with light level. That is, the motions are sufficiently slow given the delays. And what we found interesting was the evolutionary consequence of this is that if you look at the power, um, that is, flowers just in natural world, subject to wind, they vibrate, right? And this is the power spectrum of floral vibration in natural conditions. Call it the flower power. Um, the flower power declines dramatically. So, in fact, they don't even move very much where the visual delays get large. So, in fact, the visual delays are permissible given the function that the moth has to do. Okay? All right. That's something we just completed. This is what we're in the middle of now. And this is my last story. So I have this moth feeding from a flower. And um, it's obviously the flower's moving. The moth can see that the flower's moving, right? But the moth also has this proboscis in the flower. And it's feeding from the flower. And chances are it has mechanosensory information. How would I go about resolving how important that mechanosensory information. I'm going to tell you immediately that um, based on the literature and based on our own experience, we didn't think it was important. And we, in fact, were a few reviews of some of our past papers. A reviewer goes, how do you know that's not important? We go, well, you know, it's, they're so visually dominated, right? Um, let's, let, let's follow this through. Um, in this particular instance, as the animal's moving along, right, I have the floral face and the nectary moving like this, okay? And if there's an error, right, if it doesn't track it well, it gets what's called sensory slip. That is, the visual signal slips relative uh, to a reference frame, right? That's called sensory slip. So the tracking error in this instance is sensory slip. If, however, I have two modalities, right, I have mechanosensory modality and visual sensory modality, and they're both neurally processed through activation, through the, the plant, the biomechanics of the body, to some dynamics, right? I have a slightly different situation. That is, if one is moving and the other wasn't, for example, if that was possible, now in an intact flower, they move obviously together, right? If these were conflicting, um, a conflict implies that the error across the two modalities cannot be minimized. If it's a single modality and that's all it is, you can minimize that error, right? But if you have a conflicting one, you can't minimize that error, okay? So what Itai did is he built an ingenious robotic flower that consists of two parts. Uh, the robotic flower that you saw earlier has the floral face and behind it, where the nectary is, right, uh, a separate robotic controller, and they just happened to move together because they were programmed to do so, right? In a slightly modified version of this experiment, he can hold the floral face that the animal sees, and there's a little slit where its proboscis goes, and he can move the nectary. The animal has a visual signal and a separate and conflicting mechanical signal, right? And in the third preparation, it's the opposite. The floral face moves, so this is massive. I know, you're saying, how can you do this to these animals? Um, it's fun. Uh, so let, let's see how this worked. Um, so here's the idea. I have the intact system in which I, if I minimize the error due to the visual, I also minimize the error here, right? Because they're coupled. They're mechanically coupled. So I can minimize both. So here is the reference signal. Here is the feedback coming through in this. And then I can minimize the difference between the output and the input, that, that error signal. It's very standard. In the conflicting one, I can minimize one, but the other error now goes up, right? So I have both of them are providing sensory streams, but they're in conflicting directions. And in the third, obviously, it goes that way. So here's the fully intact one. Um, and I'm tracing the, uh, I am not, Itai. Actually, Itai isn't, the computer is. Tracing the animal and uh, the flower. And you can see the two dots uh, that we're digitizing in real time. And it's pretty good. Um, here is a demonstration of the actual input of the flower. These are, this is the frequency spectrum of it. These are discrete frequencies that we specifically programmed. And just for, to, for those among you who are 
linear systems freaks. Um, these frequencies happen to be prime numbers. <laughs> and because they're prime numbers, no frequency is a multiple of any other frequency. So if we see energy in at a frequency and energy out at a frequency, we can be sure that there's not something strange going on. Okay? So series of prime frequencies, there's the animal's FFT. It's doing a really good job. I'm, I'm actually impressed. Okay? But we knew this all along. Here's the other experiment. There you see in the back the nectary moving. And the flower is staying the same. This is, this is going to make you all want to just study animals, isn't it? Uh, well, it gets meaner. Hold on. And here again, not bad. Uh, uh, so you have to understand my lab, I've been going visual information is driving the behavior. I used, I can't tell you how many talks I gave saying these are visually motivated behaviors. And I don't think so. Let me keep going. Here is the other experiment. Now I'm moving the floral face, but the nectary is intact, not moving, and it's doing poorly. Not horribly, well, pretty bad. So in the intact, in this organism, this animal, right, it's doing quite poorly. The gain here, this, I'll talk about this in a minute, is much, much lower. I mean, you can still see the energy at all the frequencies, right? But it's doing much, much, that modality is not helping it. So there's a conflict. So here is the intact flower, the one where the back of the flower is moving, the one where the front of the flower is moving, and here are their spectra. And we could um, also look at the error, uh, the tracking error, due to the visual signal and the mechanosensory signal. It turns out in either preparation, the animal maintains a relatively constant error level in both modalities. So it keeps the error in the mechanosensory kind of low, regardless of the uh, conflict, and keeps the visual sensory information somewhat low. Um, little tiny tutorial. Sorry, um, it's more for the students on uh, linear systems and Bode plots, because I need to show you something called a Bode plot. Okay. So a linear system, the defining properties are they scale, and you can superimpose them. Scaling means if I double the input, my output will double if it's a linear system. If I have it, it halves. So it's just straight scaling is a wonderful feature of linear systems. And they're superimposable. That is, if I take input one plus input two, the output for input one and the output for input two linearly sum if the input's linearly sum. Okay? Those are the principles of dynamical linear systems. Uh, and then, if you, therefore, if you put a sine wave in, which is a temporally varying signal, you will get a sine wave out at that frequency if it's a linear system. Right? And at any frequency, if you have a sine wave in and a sine wave out, the ratio of their amplitudes is the gain. Okay? So I'm going to use gain. Okay? And then there is a time, potential time shift, right? which we'll call the phase. So I have two things that are frequency-dependent features, and these are called the gain and the phase. And that phase and gain can vary uh, 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 at any particular frequency. Okay. And therefore, and finally, Fourier, uh, I just love Jean-Baptiste uh, Fourier. Well, I never knew him, but I think his work was great. Um, continuous signals can be de decomposed into their sums. Okay. So here, for example, at low frequency, I have a high gain right there. And as I increase my frequency, the gain can stay high, but the phase begins to shift. And so this is the gain rolling off at high frequencies and the phase rolling off at high frequencies as well. So this is something we're going to look at for the MOS. Because we want to know if this is really a linear system and I delivered the sums of frequencies, is the sum of the intact approximately equal to the output of this plus this. And what you look at in that dash line is it's pretty good. In fact, it looks like this animal's a linear summation. Let me see if this is impressive at all to you. Um, the population of animals that we did for intact flowers is not the same population that we did for this flower, which is not the same population as this. So we did a population of animals to extract a transfer function for intact flowers, okay? A different population 
for the floral face moving, and yet a different one. And we literally superimpose the transfer function of the average moth, and it works really well. Which means that this is sort of mothbot, <laughs> a fairly robust system, right? Um, so a reviewer goes, yeah, that, that's pretty good evidence, but uh, I'm not super convinced this is really linear. If it's really, really linear, you should be able to give any arbitrary signal and predict its output. You should be able to actually drive the animal at any desired frequency you want. Okay? Well, we could. We could just literally move the flower at a single frequency, and I guarantee you it will track it at that frequency. But we're going to do a particularly evil experiment now. Okay? Um, this particularly evil experiment is um, we're going to construct, and bear with me, I'm going to come back to those transfer functions, a motion such that I take the same set of frequencies I did all along, but I adjust their phases at all frequencies such that the phase of the inputs of the floral phase through the transfer function will cancel at all frequencies but one. So what I'm going to do is synthesize a motion such that when I pass that input through the moth transfer function, I will drive it at a single frequency. I'm <laughs> the skeptical look I just got. Did the, so, so it's like, really? Let me show you how this looks. Here's the moth, and now watch. I'm doing something really weird in the front and the back, okay? Um, and um, wow, what a mess. What am I to do, says the moth, right? So if, in fact, it's linear and the moth doesn't just give up, I should get exactly what we got. We specifically drove it at a frequency of 0.7 hertz such that all other of the inputs had their phases such that they were destructively summing and only one was constructively summing. Reviewer says, yeah, but how do you know moths just don't prefer to fly at 0.7 hertz? <laughs> okay, try a different frequency. And I'll not bore you with that. Uh, it goes on, and lo and behold, you'll see it's doing pretty good. Uh, oops, uh, there's the motion that we get out. So that's the actual time series, and there's the spectrum. There's a little bit of bleed off to the side, okay? And it looks pretty strongly linear. That's great. Let me remind you, all we were trying to do is ask how the nervous system assembles information from different sources. We're using engineering methods to understand that, right? I'm not trying to inspire a refueling system on an uh, airborne airplane, although, you know, the refueling and airborne aircraft could use this kind of thinking. Um, and you just need a long, sensitive proboscis and trust the data coming in over your visual data, okay? A lot, like three times your visual data. Um, I told you earlier that the sensory conflict experiment let us pull apart these relative influences, and we could test it accordingly. I'm running a little long. Uh, but let me just say, um, we could mathematically do uh, a the sensory conflict experiment, which we've done physically. It's very difficult for us to remove mechanosensory information, but mathematically we could do this, right? We simply just redefine the, sense the, the transfer function for um, uh, something that's simply absent mechanosensory information. We simply cross that M out, right? And what's interesting is if we were able to do the experiment of just canceling the mechanosensory information, this is not an experiment we have done yet, but we would make a prediction on how well the animal would do without the visual information. Okay? Not in conflict, but without it. Right? So here's our original estimate of what's going on. Notice it's doing very well here, relatively poorly here. What happens if I remove the mechanosensory information or the other way, remove the visual, each one in and of themselves, if they operated in true isolation, they would do very well. Let's see why that is the case. Okay? This is a transfer function uh, for a system in which you've got a linear superposition of the two inputs. And we've rather strongly, I would argue, demonstrated linear superposition. Okay? So I have the gains of the mechanical sensory and visual sensory through the neural processor and the physical plant. Let me just put approximately what these gains are. 
uh, don't worry about the physical plant. I, I, it's good that I put the plant in green. Um, uh, but you know, the uh, mechanosensory system is about 15, or about, I'm sorry, three times greater than the visual sensory gain. And what's really interesting about this transfer function, if we're looking at tracking performance, is um, in this particular instance, you have 20 over 21. You're doing about 0.95. Use that as your frame of reference. Now let's say I completely eliminate the visual sensory information or the mechanosensory information, right? Here I've eliminated it so that uh, it should be the other way. Uh, what just happened here? Well, look at it this way. If I make uh, the um, visual information, uh, mechanosensory information zero, I get five six, right? If I make the visual information, I get 15 sixteenths. These are fundamentally doing really well, each and of themselves. So this system, this high gain in parallel summing architecture, actually gives a robust response. That is, it completely knocks something out. Even though it looks like you need that mechanosensory one to run that behavior, when it's conflicting, right, it overrides the visual. But absent mechanosensory information, it would do quite well. So this is what the control theorists tell us about the biology, that this parallel structure with high gain affords robustness. So the flower tracking behavior is mechanosensory dominant, but doesn't mean that if you kill mechanosensory, it can't accomplish the behavior. That means if I did the sensory isolation experiment, I would have drawn a conclusion. Now, oh, the animal does perfectly well with vision alone, therefore all that's needed is vision. I would have drawn the wrong conclusion, right? A linear model does a beautiful prediction. We're stunned by that. Fundamentally, this is a whole series of nonlinear cascades that give rise to this behavior. The aerodynamics are nonlinear. This is flapping flight, right? The sensor processing is nonlinear. But it's in closed loop. And because it's in closed loop behavior, it's always pushing back to the equilibrium. So it's always approximately linear. And we should not have been surprised in retrospect. But we were. The sensor system doesn't seem to be doing any reweighting that we can tell, but we're going to check that. Uh, lingering review comments. And linear summation with high gain affords robustness. And sensory isolation is not often possible, but may be undesirable. Um, so we looked at examples of natural solutions, some inertial sensing, and engineering approaches. I was trying to do this two-way street. Uh, I want to just conclude by saying keep the dialogue open between life science and engineering both ways, not just one way. Thanks to all of you uh, for your patience. Now I have a important question. Oh, shoot. <laughs> um, you weren't one of the reviewers, right? <laughs> no, when, when you uh, make those conclusions, multi-sensory uh, possibilities, similar, right? Integrated signals. But the experimental process of animals, right, was a capture from nature, or you grow them in a container, never exposed to two different, you know, flowers, natural flowers. So, the, the, in other words, in nature, the flower has been trained, and the animal has been trained. So, these two systems are already interacting by training, just like we go through university. And science training, then we know how to science. Then you make those conclusions, right? So, they go through training. What if you raise those mosses in, in an isolated container, never exposed flower? You get so, so, so two things. These moths are raised in isolation, never exposed to the flowers. So there's no training, okay, number one. Number two, you can take wild moths, and they'll do exactly the same behavior. So um, one of the advantages of insect model systems is that you have these innate behaviors that you can explore. There isn't a ton of learning, although you can, and I think you might learn, that you demonstrate learning in certain kinds of associations, right? But at this scale of behavior, um, what I would call the sensory motor loop, that really tight inner loop, closed loop behavior, there doesn't seem to be a lot of learning. Um, you can push it. You can challenge the animal to adapt to really, really difficult virtual reality systems, which we've done, um, and they will adapt. Right? So the, they're plastic, they're adaptive, but this behavior is pretty innate. So again, our moths are raised in our building, never having seen a flower, let alone a 3D printed robotic flower. Okay, <laughs> great question. Really nice talk.
for the body diagram, the scatter in sum are very large. So to take a mean, what's the distribution? Yeah. So that's a really interesting question. So first of all, you're, there is high variance from uh, animal to animal. So it's actually quite surprising that the mean actually works. Okay, that we could do, so you, you do realize that when we did the destructive wave summation, yeah. we used population averages and then did it to a different population. So we, we actually took average behavior from one group of animals to program a robotic motion to drive a behavior in another group, right? So the average seems to work, but not perfectly, right? What well, is the average sense, right? So right. if I'm going to get a one tanker to fill the other one, I cannot just use average. No. No, you'd want to do a Bodhi plot on all your tankers. Uh, <laughs> And so, like, and one of the challenges is your tankers, uh, as one moves fuel to the other, masses are changing and stuff like that. But let me let me um, pull on another thread that this is a really this is a really profound issue about variance in um, dynamical systems in uh, in this context. So I gave you a structure, uh, an architecture for the closed loop control. And that architecture is two inputs linearly summing. And what I get out of that is a mathematical, uh, this is a project we're working on now. So I get a mathematical form of blah plus blah over one plus blah plus blah. Okay, did, I'm sorry about that. I actually could get that exact same form by different architectures. Okay, so I could have a notch filter and a low pass and a high pass. I could actually get a very similar form, but the coefficients would be moving around. It'd be like uh, just sort of S over one plus S. I can do this by a variety of mechanisms. And how variance plays through these systems is really different. So what we're currently doing is asking, do different architectures with the same functional form lead to different ways in which variance plays through? And can we use the natural variation to reveal the underlying architecture? So I, I was turning it upside down. That is the variation, how that plays through, can be informative about the structure. So do you see tiny dependency in terms of learning part? Uh, not in this. Um, so there are a bunch of reasons why we keep our experiments fairly short term. Uh, one is that the animals get sated. Okay? The other is it has a finite volume of nectar that we can move around. Um, also, um, we only do one trial per animal. So there's a reason why we had to do population averages. The we, reason we do one trial per animal is they do behave differently when they're sated, when they're not hungry. In fact, they tend not to do the behavior for quite a while. So there are practical reasons why we just do one trial per animal. Um, there's a whole bunch of other experiments we've done where we can demonstrate the animals adapt, they figure things out, they're plastic. Um, I, I don't want to go too much into it, but we had some virtual reality uh, systems where we're probing uh, neural processing due to visual stimulus. And you can put the animal in closed loop so that it can physically control its visual world, just like you would with a joystick or a game. And as you change the game, even reverse the game, the animals eventually accomplish the task. So even though these, we think of these as sort of primitive, simple nervous systems, they're, and I think, Sanjay, you may be talking about learning and adaptation. No, not too much. Okay. <laughs> I think you should change your talk. <laughs> uh, but... So, so there is adaptation, but we don't see it in the short time frame. Yeah, but I think to me the most, if I may, the one most uh, surprising, most interesting thing is, on the one hand, it's, it seems to be so linear. On the other hand, without kind of scatter, what does it mean? It's not clear to me. That's right. So the scatter is. You know, some of the special space parts, some of them are really large. It's up there, um, but you know that's not too shabby for um, natural systems, actually. Um, no, I'm talking about phase. Oh, the phase. So that this is not reliable here. Sorry, the the energy is so low, we don't really trust the phase out there. Um, so I would just focus on say the frequencies down here. So even though it seems like linear superposition is working well at that frequency. Your, way, your, your energy's rolled way off, so my, rely, my ability to resolve phase is quite poor. The implication is less. Yeah, yeah, the implication is less. Absolutely. Sorry, I, I missed that point. 
first? Uh -huh. Yeah, so many questions, but I'll follow up with you later on this one. So you say that there's no sensory reweighting, and you you base that on the fact that they don't reweight depending on the reliability of the cube based on the motion. Right. But the animal would have no reason under that situation to believe that the cues were any less reliable. I mean, it seems to me that if you want to show there's no reweighting, you would go back to the luminance yeah. experiment because there the animal has a prior that the tracking, the low light would be unreliable and therefore would have be more information to reweight. Yeah. So it's exactly that experiment we're doing. So dropping the luminance level down. Um, there's some challenges with it, but it, you know, that that's something we can ask. What we meant with reweighting is when one signal is sort of the dominant source of information relative to the other. It's not like they're doing anything but a linear sum of those. But there could be sensory reweighting if we drop luminance. We can't. We don't know how to drop. Uh, the, the, the animal would have no reason to reweight right. in that right. situation right. where it's conflicting, unless it had some cue that. The, that it was in that situation. Where that's, that's right. That's right. So we're, we are doing I mean, those. He's doing the quote unquote optimal. But he, I mean, if you believe that the, the space. He's tracking as well as you can. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Very good. In the uh, uh, experiment of robotic flower, how can you ensure that the insects is, cannot look through the slip and detect the motion of the robot and actor through the slip? The, the thing behind the flower. Yeah, we're never 100% sure. Um, there are a couple things that we know. Um, first of all, it's a very narrow slit. Uh, the nectar in the back is painted black, so it has no real good visual contrast. And, other, and the other thing is when the animal's feeding, um, most of the visual system is not pointing down towards the, where the nectar is. They tend to be above it. So it's unlikely they could see it, but that's as good as we could do. Great question. I get asked that every time. There is, there is a possibility that uh, when the robotic beetles move and, and, and it's claimed in your experiment that um, it is uh, uh, an only visual um, stimuli to the insects, but maybe there is uh, um, the insect is thinking, oh, I'm predicting the flower will move this way, but the nectar doesn't move. So I predict, maybe I should stay here and just make that small movement. Right. So, um, in a sense, with, when they're minimizing the error in mechanosensory, they're making a small movement. I don't think they're doing prediction of where the flower is going, um, and that was another reason why we chose this linear superposition of prime uh, prime frequencies. Is it's a very hard to predict motion, right? Particularly only exposed to it for a short time, right? So, um, if we gave them just a sine wave. Um, it's possible they could do a prediction on that. And in the transfer function, how can you ensure the block of the input of uh, visual stimuli and chemical stimuli are both with gain of one? Oh, chemical. Um, so, um, well, we don't assure they're a gain of one. Uh, and the chemical stimulus in this case is what we call broad base chemical stimulus. Basically, there's a scent available in the chamber but it's not at the flower. Um, and as it turns out, the animals won't feed unless they smell flower. But once they smell it, then they'll do all the behaviors. Um, so it's not like there's a, they're chemically detecting where the flower is. They're chemically detecting that there is flower. I mean, in the transfer function, there is two inputs, right? But maybe one, have, uh, one of the inputs has a greater gain one, and before going to the neural property. Maybe there is a coefficient of two or three um, for the um, chemical, um, chemical input. Oh, oh. Um, so we're not doing any modulation of the chemical input. We have, we have mechanical input and visual. Maybe I'm misunderstanding your question. Um, two stimuli, right? Mechanical? Oh, no. One of those, uh, one of those is the movement of the needles, and one of those is the movement of the nectar. Yeah. Nectary. Uh, nectary means the smell, right? Uh, no, no, 
No, uh, the, it's um, the proboscis is in a structure. So nectar is just ensuring that they continue the behavior. If there isn't food, they'll go and they'll leave it. Okay? So all that we're doing is we're providing enough nectar so that they stay on task. It's mechanical. Yes. Yeah. No, that's a great, thank you. you that was an important point. No, that's a good point. If there are no more questions, I would like to close this session. Please join me to send Professor Tom Daniel.